responses to matters of national security and consider how they might affect the president's image. The OPA must therefore have a designated staffer who communicates not only with other White House offices, but also with the cabinet and executive branch agencies. Office of Cabinet Affairs, OCA The OCA's role has changed to some degree over the course of various administrations. But its overriding function remains the same, to ensure the coordination of policy and communication between the White House and the cabinet. Most important, the OCA coordinates all cabinet meetings with the president. It should also organize and administer regular meetings of the deputy secretaries because they also typically serve vital roles in the departments and agencies and, further, often become acting secretaries when cabinet members resign. There should be one cabinet secretary who reports to the chief of staff's office, either directly or through a deputy chief, according to the chief's preference and focus. The cabinet secretary maintains a direct relationship with all members of the cabinet. The OCA further consists of deputies and special assistants who work with each department's principal, deputy secretary, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and other senior staff. The OCA also connects the departments to WHO offices. The OCA coordinates with the Chief of Staff's Office and the Office of Communications to promote the President's agenda through the Cabinet departments and agencies. The Cabinet's communication staffers are obviously another critical component of this operation. In prior administrations, the OCA has played a vital role by tracking the President's agenda for the Chief of Staff, Deputy Chiefs, and Senior Advisors. It has worked with each department and agency to advance policy priorities. In the future, amplifying this function would truly benefit both the President and the Conservative movement. From time to time throughout an administration, travel optics, ethics challenges, and hatch ACT7 issues involving cabinet members, deputies, and senior staffers can arise. The OCA is normally tasked with keeping the WHO informed of such developments and providing support if and when necessary. The ideal cabinet secretary will have exceptional organizational skills and be a seasoned political operative or attorney. Because many cabinet officials have been former presidential candidates, governors, ambassadors, and members of Congress, the ideal candidate should also possess the ability to interact with and persuade accomplished individuals. Office of Public Liaison, OPL The OPL is critically important in building coalitions and support for the President's agenda across every aligned social, faith-based, minority, and economic interest group. It is a critical tool for shaping public opinion and keeping myriad supporters, as well as frenemies and opponents alike who are within reach, better informed. The OPL is a notably large office. It should have one director who reports to the Chief of Staff's office, either directly or through a deputy, according to the Chief's preference and focus. The director must maintain relationships not only with other WHO heads, but also with the senior staff of every cabinet department and agency. Since a president's agenda is always in motion, it is important for the OPL to facilitate listening sessions to receive the views of the various leaders and members of key interest groups. The OPL should also have a sufficient number of deputies and special assistants to cover the vast number of disparate interest groups that are engaged daily. They OPL has, by far, held more meetings in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, EEOB, and within the West Wing itself than any other office within the WHO. The OPL is the chief White House enforcer and gatekeeper among these various interest groups. It has operated best whenever the chief of staff has given it permission to use both the proverbial carrot and the proverbial stick. To make this work, communication with the chief's office is vital. Additionally, the OPL has had an outsized role in presidential scheduling and both official and political travel. The OPL director should come from the president's election campaign or capital. Hill but should not have deeply entrenched connections to a K Street entity or any other potential stakeholder. Some prior relationships can create real or perceived biases toward one group or another. The director should be amiable, gregarious, highly organized, and willing to shoulder criticism and pushback from interest groups and other elements of the administration. Unlike the director, OPL deputies and special assistants need a deep understanding of the capital, from K Street to Capitol Hill. They should have extensive experience in private industry, the labor sector, the conservative movement, and among the specific interest groups with which they will be asked to engage on behalf of the White House. OPL staffers work with more external and internal parties than any other WHO staffers. In turn, they must be effective communicators and initiative takers. They must also be able to influence, persuade, and most important listen to various stakeholders and ensure that they feel heard. All OPL staffers must understand from the outset that their jobs might be modified or even phased out entirely as the administration's priorities change. Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, IGA The IGA connects the White House to state, county, local, and tribal governments. In other words, it is the one-stop shop for disseminating an administration's agenda to all non-federal government entities. The IGA should have a director to whom one or two deputy directors report. The director must ensure that the White House remains connected to all non-federal government entities. The interests and perspectives of these entities are represented in policy discussions, 
organized events with the West Wing, EOP senior staff, and IGA staff throughout the departments and agencies. The IGA can be staffed in a variety of ways, but two arrangements are most common. L each deputy and that deputy's staffers are responsible for a type of government. L a group of staffers is responsible for a specific geographical region of the country. The IGA, as suggested above, represents the interests and perspectives of non-federal government entities, but its primary job is to make sure that these entities understand an administration's agenda and ultimately support it. The IGA must work with all other White House offices, especially the OPA and the OPL, and manage its staff throughout the departments and agencies. IGA staffers must therefore have communication skills, understand political nuance, and be willing to engage in complex policy discussions. They should also be not just generally responsive, but also proactive in seeking out the interests and perspectives of non-federal government entities. White House Policy Councils As the federal government has ballooned in size over the past century, it has become increasingly difficult for the president alone to direct his agenda across the executive branch. Three White House Policy Councils have come into existence to help the president to control the bureaucracy and ensure continued alignment between agency leadership and White House priorities. Those councils as previewed. Above are the NSC, NEC, and DPC. Each is headed by an assistant to the president and performs three significant functions. L. Policy Coordination The primary role of the policy councils is to coordinate the development of administration policy. This frequently includes developing significant legislative priorities, coordinating policy decisions that impact multiple departments and agencies, and at times coordinating policy decisions within a single department or agency. This process must ensure that all relevant offices are included, that competing or conflicting opinions are thoroughly discussed and evaluated, and, when there is disagreement among White House senior staff or among cabinet members, a well-structured question is presented to the president for an intermediate or final decision. L. Policy Advice By virtue of working in the White House, the heads of the three policy councils will also function as independent policy advisors to the president. This aspect of the role will vary depending on the individual in this position and the president's governing philosophy. Incumbents have ranged from honest brokers, who mostly coordinate and ensure that all opinions are fairly presented to the president, to policy deciders, who largely drive a given policy topic on behalf of the president. L. Policy Implementation The policy councils also manage and mediate the implementation of previous policy decisions. Implementation of a new statute or an executive order frequently takes years and involves many distinct and more granular policy decisions along the way. It is essential to have a centralized process for evaluating and coordinating these decisions, especially if they involve more than one cabinet department or agency with differing opinions on the best approach for securing the president's goals. The above functions have recently been managed by policy councils through a tiered interagency policy process. This process helps to identify differences of opinion and reach a decision without having to take every issue to the president. It can be used to address a single question or monitor a recurring issue on an ongoing basis. Typically, the process involves multiple cabinet departments and agencies that have a pertinent role, policy interest, or disagreement. Each policy council's process could involve the following committees. L. Policy Coordinating Committee, PCC. A PCC is led by a special assistant to the president from the policy council and includes political assistant secretary level experts from the relevant departments, agencies, or offices. The purpose is to determine where consensus exists clearly identify where there are differing opinions, and develop options for resolving the remaining questions. If no outstanding questions or disagreements exist, the PCC may resolve the issue and move toward implementation at the agency level. L. Deputies Committee, D.C. A D.C. is a meeting of presidentially appointed executives chaired by the Policy Council's deputy assistant to the president and relevant deputy secretaries. It evaluates the options produced by the PCC and frequently directs the PCC to add, expand, or re-evaluate an option or even to reach a compromise and resolve an issue at that level. L. Principles Committee, PC. When questions are not resolved by a DC, the director of the Policy Council will chair a PC, which is attended by the relevant cabinet secretaries and senior White House political staff. This is the final opportunity for the President's most senior advisors to discuss the question, make sure that each principal's position is carefully understood, and see whether consensus or a compromise might be reached. If not, the Chief of Staff's office will schedule time for the PC to meet with the President for a final decision. Despite having seemingly clear and separate portfolios, the three policy councils frequently have areas of overlap, which can result in confusion, duplication, or conflict. For example, there are the areas of immigration and border security. Either NSC or DPC, health care, energy, and environment, either NEC or DPC, and trade and international economic policy, either NSC or NEC. Identifying these potentially problematic areas and assigning policy responsibilities to only one council where possible will help to speed up the policy coordination process. While other chapters will cover specific policy goals for each department or agency, 
incoming policy councils will need to move rapidly to lead policy processes around cross-cutting agency topics, including countering China, enforcing immigration laws, reversing regulatory policies in order to promote energy production, combating the left's aggressive attacks on life and religious liberty, and confronting wokeism throughout the federal government. National Security Council The NSC is intended to be an interdepartmental body within the White House that can set national security policy with a whole-of-government approach. Unlike the other policy councils, the NSC was established by statute.8 statutory members and advisors who are currently part of the NSC include the President and Vice President, the Secretaries of State, Defense and Energy, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Director of National Intelligence.9. The NSC staff, and particularly the National Security Advisor, should be vetted for foreign and security policy experience and insight. The National Security Advisor and NSC staff advise the President on matters of foreign policy and national security, serve as an information conduit in times of crisis, and as liaisons ensuring that written communications are properly shared among NSC members. Special attention should be given to the use of data aisles to staff the NSC. In recent years, the NSC staff size has been right-sized from its peak of 400 in 2015 down to 100-150 professional members. The next administration should try to limit the number of data aisles to ensure more direct presidential control. National Economic Council The NEC was established in 1993 by executive order and has four key functions. L to coordinate the economic policy-making process with respect to domestic and international economic issues. L to coordinate economic policy advice to the President. L to ensure that policy decisions and programs are consistent with the President's stated goals and that those goals are being effectively pursued. L to monitor implementation of the President's economic policy agenda 10. The NEC director coordinates and implements the President's economic policy objectives by working with cabinet secretaries, their departments, and multiple agencies. The director is supported by a staff of policy experts in various fields, including infrastructure, manufacturing, research and development, agriculture, small business, financial regulation, housing, technology and innovation, and fiscal policy. The NEC considers economic policy matters and the DPC typically considers anything related to domestic matters with the exception of economic policy matters. It also differs from the Council of Economic Advisors, CEA. Whereas the NEC is in charge of policy development, the CEA acts as the White House's internal research arm for economic analysis. It is therefore critically important to find people with the right qualifications to head both the NEC and the CEA. The CEA is almost always led by a well-known academic economist, and the NEC is regularly led by someone with expertise in directing the president's economic policy process. Those who have served in the role have ranged from former CEOs of the nation's largest investment firms to financial services industry managers to seasoned congressional staffers who have managed the economic policy issues for top financial and tax writing committees. Domestic Policy Council The Domestic Policy Council, DPC, consists of advisors to the president on non-economic domestic policy issues as well as international issues with a significant domestic component such as immigration. It is one of the primary policy councils serving the President along with the NSC and NEC. The Director serves as the principal DPC advisor to the President, along with members of the Cabinet, and the Deputy Director chairs the committee responsible for coordinating domestic policy development at the Deputy Secretary level. In this respect, both the Director and the Deputy Director have critical institutional functions that affect the development of domestic policy throughout the administration. The DPC also has policy experts, for example, special assistants to the President, or SAPs, who are responsible for developing and coordinating, as well as for advising the President, on specific issues. It is essential that DPC policy expertise reflect the most prominent issues that are before the administration, issues such as the environment, health care, housing, and immigration. In addition, DPC SAPs should demonstrate a working knowledge of the rulemaking process, although they need not necessarily be experts on regulation because a working knowledge of the rulemaking process will facilitate the DPC's effectiveness in coordinating administration policy. The DPC also needs to work closely with other offices within the Executive Office of the President to promote economic opportunity and private sector innovation. This includes working with the Office of Management and Budget and its Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs as well as the Council of Economic Advisors, Council on Environmental Quality, and Office of Science and Technology. Policy To this end, the Director should chair a standing meeting with the principals from each of the other EOP offices to enhance coordination from within the White House. Several areas will be especially important as the DPC works to develop a well-defined domestic policy agenda. One is the promotion of innovation as a foundation for economic growth and opportunity. The President should establish an Economic Opportunity Working Group, chaired by the DPC Director, to coordinate the development of policies that promote economic opportunity. 
Another important area is the promotion of health care reform to bring down costs for the American people and the pressure that spending on health programs puts on the federal budget. Finally, DPC should coordinate with the NSC on a policy agenda to enhance border security. Office of the Vice President, OVP In modern U.S. history, the Vice President has acted as a significant advisor to the President. Once elected, the VP helps to promote and, in many instances, put into place and execute the President's agenda. The President may additionally determine the inclusion of OVP staff in White House meetings, including Policy Coordinating Committee, Deputies Committee and Principals Committee discussions. As has been done in various recent administrations. Recent Presidents have decided to give Vice Presidents space in the West Wing. The VP's proximity to the President as well as to the Chief of Staff and additional senior advisors makes his or her role a powerful one within the West Wing. Presidents typically tap VPS to lead various administration efforts. These efforts have included serving on the NSC Principals Committee, heading the National Space Council, addressing immigration and border issues, leading the response to health care crises, and supervising workforce programs. VPS traditionally also spearhead projects of personal interest that have been authorized by the President. The VP is also charged with breaking tie votes in the Senate and in recent years has served abroad as a brand ambassador for the White House and more broadly the United States, announcing administration priorities and coordinating with heads of state and other top foreign government officials. The Vice President, as President of the Senate, could be a president's emissary to the Senate. Office of the First Lady slash First Gentleman The First Lady or First Gentleman plays an interesting role in the formation, implementation and execution of policy in concert with the President. Active and interested first spouses often champion a select number of signature issues, whether they be thorny social issues or deeper policy issues. One advantage of the first spouses taking on hot-button social issues is that any political backlash will be less severe than it would be for the president. The first spouse normally appoints a chief of staff who has enough assistance to support the spouse's activities in the east wing of the White House. This group works exclusively with the first spouse and senior members of the White House along with EOP personnel to implement and execute the first spouse's priorities which reflect the first spouse's passions and interests and are often identified as important in discussions with the president. Executed well, they can be strategically useful in accelerating the administration's agenda. Past East Wing initiatives have focused on such issues as combating bullying, fighting drug abuse, promoting literacy and encouraging physical education for young adults and children. The first spouse is afforded significant resources. His or her staff also works with the president's policy team, members of the cabinet, and other EOP staff. Authors note, the preparation of this chapter was a collective enterprise of individuals involved in the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. All contributors to this chapter are listed at the front of this volume, but Edwin Meese III, Donald Devine, Ambassador Andrew Bremberg, and Jonathan Bronitsky deserve special mention. The author alone assumes responsibility for the content of this chapter, and no views expressed herein should be attributed to any other individual. End Notes 1 U.S. Constitution, Art. 2, 1 https slash slash constitution dot congress dot gov slash constitution slash article two slash accessed february fourteenth twenty twenty three two u s constitution art two two three u s constitution art two three four u s constitution art two two five c chapter two executive office of the president infra six h r four thousand three hundred and twenty eight Omnibus Consolidated and Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Act, 1999, Public Law No. 105-277, 105 105th Congress, October 21, 1998, Division C, Title I, 151, https slash slash www.congress.gov slash 105 slash pla slash publ 277 slash plaw 105 publ 277.pdf, accessed February 15, 2023. 7S 1871, an act to prevent pernicious political activities, Public Law No. 76-252, 76th Congress, August 2, 1939, https govtrackisss slash legislink slash pdf slash stat slash 53 slash statute 53 pg 1147.pdf, accessed March 7, 2023. 8S 758, National Security Act of 1947. Public Law No. 80-253, 80th Congress, July 26, 1947, https//govtrackis.s3.amazonas.com slash legislink slash pdf slash stat slash 61 slash statute 61 pg 495.pdf, accessed February 15, 2023. The National Security Council was established by the National Security Act of 1947, PL 23561 STAT 496, USC 402 amended by the National Security Act Amendments of 1949, 
63 STAT 579, 50 USC 401 ETSEQ. Later in 1949, as part of the reorganization plan, the council was placed in the executive office of the president. The White House, National Security Council, https slash slash www.whitehouse.gov slash nsc slash, accessed February 15, 2023. 9C Chapter 2, Executive Office of the President, Infra. 10 President William J. Clinton, Executive Order 12835, Establishment of the National Economic Council, January 25, 1993, in Federal Register, Volume 58, Number 16. January 27, 1993, pages 6189 6190, https slash slash www.govinfo.gov slash content slash package slash fr 1993 01 27 slash pdf slash fr 1993 01 27.pdf, accessed March 7, 2023. 10 Presidents 1993 to 1997, 2. Executive Office of the President of the United States. Russ Vaught. In its opening words, Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution makes it abundantly clear that t he executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America 1 that enormous power is not vested in departments or agencies, in staff or administrative bodies, in non-governmental organizations or other equities and interests close to the government. The President must set and enforce a plan for the executive branch. Sadly, however, a President today assumes office to find a sprawling federal bureaucracy that all too often is carrying out its own policy plans and preferences or, worse yet, the policy plans and preferences of a radical, supposedly woke faction of the country. The modern conservative president's task is to limit, control, and direct the executive branch on behalf of the American people. This challenge is created and exacerbated by factors like Congress's decades-long tendency to delegate its lawmaking power to agency bureaucracies, the pervasive notion of expert independence. That protects so-called expert authorities from scrutiny, the presumed inability to hold career civil servants accountable for their performance, and the increasing reality that many agencies are not only too big and powerful, but also increasingly weaponized against the public and a president who is elected by the people and empowered by the Constitution to govern. In Federalist No. 47, James Madison warned that t he accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny too regrettably, that wise and cautionary note describes to a significant degree the modern executive branch, which whether controlled, by the bureaucracy or by the president writes federal policy, enforces that policy, and often adjudicates whether that policy was properly drafted and enforced. The overall situation is constitutionally dire, unsustainably expensive, and in urgent need of repair. Nothing less than the survival of self-governance in America is at stake. The great challenge confronting a conservative president is the existential need for aggressive use of the vast powers of the executive branch to return power including power currently held by the executive branch to the American people. Success in meeting that challenge will require a rare combination of boldness and self-denial, boldness to bend or break the bureaucracy to the presidential will and self-denial to use the bureaucratic machine to send power away from Washington and back to America's families, faith communities, local governments, and states. Fortunately, a president who is willing to lead will find in the executive office of the president, EOP, the levers necessary to reverse this trend and impose a sound direction for the nation on the federal bureaucracy. The effectiveness of those EOP levers depends on the fundamental premise that it is the president's agenda that should matter to the departments and agencies that operate under his constitutional authority and that, as a general matter, it is the president's chosen advisors who have the best sense of the president's aims and intentions, both with respect to the policies he intends to enact and with respect to the interests that must be secured to govern successfully on behalf of the American people. This chapter focuses on key features of and recommendations for several of the EOP's important components. U.S. Office of Management and Budget, OMB OMB assists the president in the execution of his policy agenda across the government. By employing many statutory and executive procedural levers to bring the bureaucracy in line with all budgetary, regulatory, and management decisions. Properly understood, it is a president's air traffic control system with the ability and charge to ensure that all policy initiatives are flying in sync and with the authority to let planes take off and, at times, ground planes that are flying off course. OMB's key roles include L. Developing and enforcing the president's budget and executing the appropriations laws that fund the government. L. Managing agency and personnel performance, procurement policy, financial management, and information technology. L. Developing the president's regulatory agenda, reviewing new regulatory actions, reviewing federal information collections, and setting and enforcing federal information policy, and L. Coordinating and clearing agency communications with Congress, including testimonies and views on draft legislation. OMB cannot perform its role on behalf of the President effectively if it is not intimately involved in all aspects of the White House policy process and lacks knowledge of what the agencies are doing. 
internally to the EOP, ensuring that the policy formulation procedures developed by the White House to serve the President include OMB is one of any OMB director's major responsibilities. A common meme of those who intend to evade OMB review is to argue that where resources are not being discussed, OMB's participation is optional. This ignores both OMB's role in all downstream execution and the reality that it has the only statutory tools in the White House that are powerful enough to override implementing agencies' bureaucracies. The director must view his job as the best, most comprehensive approximation of the president's mind as it pertains to the policy agenda while always being ready with actual options to affect that agenda within existing legal authorities and resources. This role cannot be performed adequately if the director acts instead as the ambassador of the institutional interests of OMB and the wider bureaucracy to the White House. Once its reputation as the keeper of commander's intent is established, then and only then does OMB have the ability to shape the most efficient way to pursue an objective. Externally, the director must ensure that OMB has sufficient visibility into the deep caverns of agency decision-making. One indispensable statutory tool to that end is to ensure that policy officials the program associate directors, PADs, managing the vast resource management offices, RMOs, personally sign what are known as the apportionments. In 1870, Congress passed the Anti-Deficiency ACT-3 to prevent the common agency practice of spending down all appropriated funding, creating artificial funding shortfalls that Congress would have to fill. The law mandated that all funding be allotted or apportioned in installments. This process, whereby agencies come to OMB for allotments of appropriated funding, is essential to the effective financial stewardship of taxpayer dollars. OMB can then direct on behalf of a president the amount, duration, and purpose of any apportioned funding to ensure against waste, fraud, and abuse and ensure consistency with the president's agenda and applicable laws. The vast majority of these apportionments were signed by career officials the deputy associate directors, DADs, until the Trump administration placed this responsibility in the hands of the PADs and thereby opened wide vistas of oversight that had escaped the attention of policy officials. The Biden administration subsequently reversed this decision. No director should be chosen who is unwilling to restore apportionment decision-making to the PADs' personal review, who is not aggressive in wielding the tool on behalf of the president's agenda, or who is unable to defend the power against attacks from Congress. It should be noted that each of OMB's primary functions, along with other executive and statutory roles, is carried out with the help of many essential OMB support offices. The two most important offices for moving OMB at the will of a director are the Budget Review Division, BRD, and the Office of General Counsel, OGC. The director should have a direct and effective relationship with the head of the BRD, considered the top career official within OMB, and transmit most instructions through that office because the rest of the agency is institutionally inclined toward its direction and responds accordingly. The BRD inevitably will translate the directions from policy officials to the career staff, and at every stage, it is obviously vital that the director ensure that this translation is an accurate one. In addition, many key considerations involved in enacting a president's agenda hinge on existing legal authorities. The director must ensure the appointment of a general counsel who is respected yet creative and fearless in his or her ability to challenge legal precedents that serve to protect the status quo. This is vital within OMB not only with respect to the adequate development of policy options for the president's review but also with respect to agencies that attempt to protect their own institutional interests and foreclose certain avenues based on the mere assertion, 